Good morning. I, uh, I'm going to jump right into things today uh, because I want to do the scripture reading and I also want to do a reading which is a little longer from, uh, from the devotional book, uh, which I think is very, very powerful. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. As always, if you have any prayer concerns, requests, please let me know. Uh, you can do that right on Facebook, or you can send me an email, or you can call me. Um, whatever is, uh, is better for you. Okay, let us pray together. Lord God, in whom I find life, health, and strength, through whose gifts I am clothed and fed, through the days of my life, I offer my prayers through Christ. We're, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Peter, and uh, at the tail end of 1 Peter, as he's kind of getting ready to sign off, and it's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses <clears throat> excuse me, 1 through 11. And I'm back again. I uh, just lost it for a minute there, not quite sure why. But um, hopefully that won't happen again. Uh, remember, this is a letter from Peter. And as he is writing this, uh, he's writing to a whole bunch of people. And so this is, uh, again, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 of 1 Peter. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Young men, oh, I'm sorry. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong. <sighs> And rested him, yeah, <clears throat> strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So that's Peter's advice to uh, folks in the in the church, and and that includes you and me. And uh, and he has some specific words for some specific people. Uh, I think that uh, the gender. Um, you know, this young man or and elders uh, is not specified, but uh, we look past that and realize that uh, all of the same things are true for young women as for young men and, and for elders, whether they're male or female. Um, and, uh, and the whole concept of an elder is somewhat different now than it was at that point. And that would be people who are assured and uh, have been in the faith for an extended time. You've grown up. Um, sometimes that doesn't take that long to grow up a lot, you know. So, uh, uh, but especially those people who are in leadership in the church is what, uh, you know, there's there's elements where, and, and it really serves more as a warning even, you know, uh, don't think too highly of yourselves. Do the right thing, but do it for the right reason. And I think that applies across the board to all of us. And uh, do it because you want to, not because somehow God is forcing you to do that. Um, I remember when I was called to ministry, when God called me into the ministry, I remember um, the advice of a very trusted and beloved pastoral friend 
who said to me, uh, you know, as I, I went to talk to him and I said, uh, I, uh, I feel like the Lord's calling me into the ministry. And he started laughing really hard because he'd known for a long time, he'd, you know, really had that sense, that, that word from God, that that's where it was headed. And, uh, but he said, okay, so I'm going to tell you something. And he never did say to me, yes, you should go into the ministry. Um, but he did say to me, uh, he said, you know, he said, Jamie, what I'm going to tell you is what somebody told me once. And he said, it's the best advice ever. He said, do not do it if there's anything else at all that you can do. But if, in fact, you know there is nothing else you can do and be satisfied, then go and do it and do it with your whole heart. And, and that's, to a large degree, that's what Paul is saying here. Now, I want to read something uh, from a gentleman named Simon Tugwell. And, and it really is largely, I think, a response to this passage uh, because he brings up some of the things that are there. And his words are really worth listening to, okay? So uh, here we go. Another picture that our Lord loves to use is that of the shepherd who goes out to look for the sheep that is lost, from Matthew 18, 12 and forward. So long as we imagine that it is we who have to look for God then we must often lose heart. But it is the other way about. He is looking for us. And so we can afford to, to recognize that very often we are not looking for God. Far from it. We are in full flight from him. In high rebellion against him. And he knows that and has taken it into account. He has followed us into our own darkness. There, where we thought finally to escape him, we run straight into his arms. So we do not have to erect a false piety for ourselves to give us hope for salvation. That's personal sanctification. You know, I can do it myself. I, I, uh, I set up a whole list of rules and I obey those rules and I make sure I do, you know, that false piety, that righteousness that comes from within us where there is no righteousness. So what's coming out? Well, we think it's righteousness, but it's not. Okay, anyway. Our hope is in his determination to save us. Not our own self-piety, but in God's determination to save us. That's where our hope lies. And he will not give in. This should free us from that crippling anxiety which prevents any real growth. You ever experienced that? That crippling anxiety? that prohibits any real growth where where you uh, you're aware of all the details of places where you failed and you throw your hands up and you think there is nothing that can be done i can't get this right and and of course that's that's the point where things start to really change because you know what no you cannot get this right but god can get this right in you and uh, and I, you know i just i love this this reading there's more i'll, I'll get right into it here this should free us from that crippling anxiety which prevents any real growth, giving us room to do whatever we can do to accept the small but genuine responsibilities that we do have. Our part is not to shoulder the whole burden of our salvation. The initiative and the program are not in our hands. Our part is to consent, to learn how to love him in return whose love came to us so freely, well, we were quite uninterested in him. You know, our job is to consent. Our job is to say, yes, God, I will receive. You know, it's like a, a football game. You start the football game, you toss the thing in the air, and then uh, whoever wins gets to say, uh, you know, we'll kick off or we will receive. And, uh, you know, that is, that's, uh, that's a huge thing. In football it's immeasurably more huge in life when it comes to God will you receive uh, go on with uh, Simon and leave James behind here again also we can let ourselves off that desperate question am I in the right place have I done the right thing of course we must sometimes acknowledge sins and mistakes <laughs> we did the wrong thing and we must try to learn from them. 
but we should not foster the kind of worry that leads to despair. We've talked about despair two or three times since we got started in this process, haven't we? God's providence means that wherever we have got to, whatever we have done, that is precisely where the road to heaven begins. It's not like God says, uh, well, I'm going to make you do this terrible thing, and then, then you'll pay attention to me. That, that's not true. We do the thing ourselves, but God meets us there and says, you want to you wanna go from here? You know, it is uh, wherever we have gone, whatever we have done, that is precisely where the road, the walk with Christ begins. However many cues we've missed, however many wrong turnings we've taken, however unnecessarily we may have complicated our journey, the road still beckons and the Lord still waits to be gracious to us. You, have you taken some wrong turns? Have you messed your life up so thoroughly and you don't think there's any hope? You go, you go down to despair, don't you? But the reality is that God is waiting there. Wherever you are, God is seeking you out, searching you out, finding you, and, uh, and wants to take you from that point. If we let these things really speak to us, then we can surely accept our Lord's invitation indeed his command to cast all our cares upon him and let him care for them that is our cares let him care for our cares we can give space in our hearts for christ to dwell there and it is faith that gives him space we can let him dethrone us from being god in our own hearts and establish there his own rule we can then let him give him give us to ourselves. Let me read that again because that it sounds a little stranger. We can then let him give us to ourselves, just as at the beginning he gave Adam to Adam. Then we can receive him, and from him all that is ours, all our faculties, all our freedom, our capacity to take initiatives to make our own decisions so that our own true independence no longer challenges God's sovereignty, but is precisely a most wonderful expression of God's sovereignty. As we receive our freedom day by day, minute by minute, from the creative love of God. And this is such a... Uh, such a powerful reading. It, it just it struck me so thoroughly. Well, I guess I didn't want to put that away because I get the um, the nature of you know what it is that we're doing and where we at where we're at uh, never can stand as a blockade to God. The, the only thing that can blockade God is within us. It's not the external actions. It's not the the things that we've done or the things that we have left undone, those mess, those take us away from God. But again, the reality is God is pursuing us through those. You know, it's not like we've failed on our journey to try to find God. We have, I suppose, you know, for, for sure, time and time we do that. But the, the great news is that God is pursuing us. And, uh, and God pursues us, and he is waiting there for us because he knows where we're going. He knows what we're going to mess up. And, and it's sort of like uh, when, when Travis got out of college, this isn't fair because he's not here, but I'm going to say it anyway. When Travis got out of college, he uh, worked that whole summer at Stony Brook uh, Park, he was a lifeguard down there. And uh, lifeguarding at Stony Brook started about 11 o'clock in the morning, as I recall, and went to about 7 o'clock at night. It, it was a great gig for a, a college student who was used to staying up late and then, you know, uh, getting up late and, uh, and, you know, living that sort of lifestyle. Well, Travis, you know, would get, would get home at 7, and then he would often take off, and he had some friends and they would get together and they'd go do music and stuff and and so you know he'd get in late and and he had a job 
teaching music at uh, at Dansville at the school there, and uh, and so as the summer was coming to a conclusion and the job was looming in the you know in the future, um, he was uh, he was still you know up late, out late, up late, out late. And uh, I'm not saying he was out partying and getting plastered and all those kind of things, because that wasn't the case. However, I said to him one day, I said, I'm only going to say this once. It was the week before he started. I said, I'm only going to say this once, and I'm not going to repeat it, and I'm not going to badger you with it, and you're not going to like it. But here's the thing. Right now, this lifestyle is working, but you're going to keep on trying to do it when uh, the job requires you to be up at 5.30 to 6 at the latest and to be at school 7 o'clock, 7.30 in the morning. So uh, you may want to reconsider your daily schedule a little bit and start getting to bed a little earlier, or at least plan on doing it by then. And I could see the look on his face was... I do not want to be told what to do, you know. And uh, and I said I, I said to him, I said, I'm not going to ever tell you that again. I've said it once. You're going to find out it's true, and it, you're not going to like it. But um, there you go. And uh, about two weeks later, he came to me after school started, sick, and uh, <laughs> and he said to me, um, you know, Dad, you were right. Few words that are more you know, <laughs> cherished by a parent's heart. Dad, you were right. Uh, he said, I "I'm sicker than a dog." He said, "And I've got to get up and go to work. You know, I can't, I can't stay out just because I'm sick." And uh, I said, "Well, you know what? You're gonna, you're gonna be sick for a while because you're gonna be catching stuff from the kids, and uh, and all of that." And I said, "But you know, you you got to figure it out." I said, "It only took you about a week of school." I said, I'm impressed. And and you came and said it to me. So you're you know, you're being accountable and that impresses me. And I said, I told you I wasn't ever gonna say anything about it again, and I'm not gonna say anything now, except that um, you gotta figure it out, good for you. And uh, and we went from there and he was living at home at the time. And uh, it wasn't like I was gonna, you know, boot, boot him out because he was staying out late. You know, it's like you're gonna figure it out, and I'm and I'm here waiting to help you if you're sick. You know, I'm I'm here waiting to help you do the things you need to do, and and it, it you know the the fact that he could come to me and say something, right, and he knew he could, which is twice the blessing, and uh, and so uh, you know I I I really uh, kind of rejoiced in that. Not not because he saw I was right, but because he picked up on it that quickly. And he got his head on straight relative to that, and and, uh, and he was good. And so, uh, I, you know, I, it, it was something that I wish he hadn't had to experience at all because he was sick for several days. Oh, my gosh, poor kid. But he learned from it, and then I was really proud of him. And that really was what, you know, where I was going with it. And so by the same token, you know, God knows we're going to mess up. And he says, you know, um, only the difference with God is I'm not just going to say it this once. If you need it again, I'll say it again. And, uh, and you know, after we fouled up, there's God sitting there going, well, are you ready now? You know, you ready to let me be in charge? You ready to let me be God? Because you're not doing a real good job of it yourself. And the whole story around this faith, you have to excuse me for just a second because it really it really hit me. A few minutes ago, uh, we had some someone who stopped by and said, I have something for you. And uh, it was a shirt. And Kathy and I uh, each got one. And it is faith written to look like a cross. And I don't know if you can see that well, because if I hold it up, I can't see it at all. Okay, so <laughs> there we go. Only it's backwards for you, I guess that's true. Anyhow, um, mine is uh, 
double extra large, 2X. And so there's, uh, my faith has a lot more space in it, you know. <laughs> and I thought about that as, as you know, this, thinking about what Simon had said, you know, there's a great deal of space in faith. And, uh, and, and God makes that space for us. So I really want you to be thinking about it from that standpoint and, and not about how perfect can I make myself. You know, that's, that's, where, we really, that's where we really foul up. Um, when you realize that you can't make yourself perfect, you can let God work in you. And, uh, and when you realize you can't make yourself perfect, you can be humble enough to allow God to do the work that needs to be done in you, which, interestingly enough, takes you in the direction that you really want to go. Again, making you, you, you know, God gives you back to you, the true you, what you were created to be in the first place, who you really are. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, God is the only one in this whole world who knows who you really are. And, uh, and he loves you. You, you may be the, 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 the worst curmudgeon, the most nasty, horrible person in the world, God doesn't like how you are, but God loves you. Now, he will pursue you to the point of, you know, till there is no pursuit left because you have made a final choice. But God's pursuit and God's opportunity is available for all of us at all times. So, uh, praise God that uh, he calls us into his service and it is for our blessing and benefit that we get to serve God because it allows us to receive ourselves. Uh, let that thought, you know, spin around in your head a little bit today. How is it that God is making you really you? And uh, if you're married, check that out with your spouse because they may be able to give you some real insights into that. And if you approach it in humility, you may find some really, really, wonderful, wonderful opportunities in that. And again, this is a time when we've got time to think. We've got time to pray. We've got time to be uh, unified with God. We've got time to listen. So listen. Will you receive the benediction? And now, may the Spirit, which was in Jesus Christ, be in us, enabling us to know God's will and empowering us to do God's will. Amen. Have a great Tuesday. Bible study tomorrow night. Look what I found. Thank you, Lord. Well, actually, that's like half blank, but... Oh, you know what? I didn't find what I thought I found. <laughs> okay, I thought I was successful, but I think I'm, I'm going to have to go listen. I found these two papers folded over in my Bible over at church, and it was like, I missed those the first time. Um, and I hadn't even opened it up because I thought I knew what they were, and they, they were not what I thought they were. So we'll see what happens anyway. So if you have some suggestions for uh, our future studies, uh, let me know. We have uh, someone who would like to look at Ecclesiastes, and that certainly is a possibility. Um, we'll check and see how things uh, how things look after tomorrow night. Okay? God bless. Bye bye.